Canadian investors are using ZSP over any other ETF for exposure to the S&P 500 index. Institutional investors, investment advisors, and DIY investors have all been trusting ZSP with their investment dollars since the fall of 2012. ETFs provide instant access to a portfolio of stocks to investors in a single cost-efficient trade. For an investor to own the entire index would require institutional level trading systems and expertise. To accomplish this, an investor would have to buy 500 stocks at a time, and then as the market moves, it would constantly have to rebalance with 500 stocks several times a year. ZSP simplifies this process by aiming to provide instant access to the 500 stocks in the index in a very easy and low cost way. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just gotta get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour, episode 141. As always, join with the three, three amigos, Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, Rich Diaz, PGM Global. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Rich, how you doing, buddy? Not so hot. Not so hot. Been sick. I'm not going to bore you with TMI, too much information, but let's just say we're we're moving slowly here. We're moving slowly. I've, I've spent most of the morning curled up in the fetal position. <laughs> <laughs> Boomer, so, looks Steve, like it's you, you have, and I, buddy. Yeah, you have to admit, though, looking at Rich, you would you kind of agree with him right now. You do. <laughs> you, you don't look your best. Oh, no. But it's it's beautiful and so hot in Montreal, which I I I remember why I love London weather. Um, it's way too hot. But I'm gonna go up north this weekend and go swimming in the lake. So it'll be fun. I was just out west for a few days. So Steve and I we got together last. Oh yeah, thir- was the Thursday night, right? How was that? Yeah, we had a good uh, good loony hour turnout. Uh, nice gentleman brought several boxes of Twinkies. Made Keith eat one. It was a good time. Chow down. I chowed down on that sucker, Rich. You should have seen it. I, I didn't get the invite. Yeah. Maybe oh, next time. Better luck next it. year, pal. <laughs> yeah. But hey, I was out west. I saw some old friends. It was a real good time. And uh, one of my friends out there chatting with, he uh, his, his main, uh, I guess, expression or quote, I think he has had a, he almost a copyright for it as well uh, at, at his business, is GSD. Get, get shit, shit done. done. Get it done. And yeah. so I think everyone, if you take that as one of the driving forces in your life, just get it done. And you'll have a lot more success with things. Anyway, it was, it was real fun to see uh, some old friends out that way. So, uh, but now I'm back here again. And uh, like Rich said, it's a bit warmer over this way than it is out west. But Steve, what are you looking for today? What do you have lined up for us? Yeah, well, just wanted to, you know, speaking of getting shit done, uh, maybe not getting shit done is uh, I wanted to touch on some of these government programs first and foremost, um, because I think there's kind of like an interesting sort of thread that we can pull on here. I think last week I mentioned the discussion around housing and, you know, the government's trying to keep house values the same, but at the same time, they want more affordable housing and kind of this double standard. And so they're, you know, the the angle they're trying to take is, well, we're going to build our way out of this. And so I think we got more evidence, not only last week, but this week about, I think the flaws in that idea. And so, you know, last week I mentioned that we're seeing all these cities, basically what's happening is they're getting all this government money, right? So the government has this like housing accelerator fund, and the government is basically stroking a check to these municipalities. And then the municipalities are turning around and raising fees on all these developments. So it's like, they're basically just, they're, they're changing their zoning saying, yeah, we'll do the zoning. No worries. You give us the money. So the, the feds stroke them a check for the change in the zoning. And then the government turns around and jacks up the development fees the so, local government, the local government, the local government. Yeah. So that the projects are actually not are not economically viable to actually build. So like it's a total heist of tax dollars. And so I'll just give you an example. 
the city of Toronto, uh, they recently received uh, $4 billion uh, from Fed, or sorry, no, they received, oh man, how much did they receive? They, uh, they received $471 million uh, in funding from the program. Uh <laughs> And then what happened was the province of Ontario introduced Bill 185. And the bill is literally called, quote, Cutting Red Tape to Build More Homes Act. And so as a result of the bill, the city of Toronto says, well, as a result of this bill, we need to increase our development fees. <laughs> and they, they increased them by 42% over the past year. Um so, and they increased them 20% after the, the bill came out. So anyways, long story short is there's all this, um, stealing of, of government funds <laughs> and no, no housing is, is probably honestly, I don't, I don't know how much housing is actually gonna get built. I don't, I don't suspect a whole lot. So, you know, I, was, I, I bumped into, uh, this person there a few weeks back and they're all excited. They're studying political science at university coming up and uh you know somebody joked about it a little bit and i said you know what courses are you taking with, with that so the courses are something like you know karl marx 101 gaslighting <laughs> 101 grifting that's a very big course as well and of course climate change you know how, how to extract the most from climate change <sighs> policies and that's it, guys. So the, I think people who are going down those roads, a lot of them do end up in this system that are creating or, or instituting these new tax policies that, that you just mentioned, Steve. How do we get out of that, Rich? How do we circle or in defense, our way out? In defense of Karl Marx, I think we should, you, you, if you, you know, you should read Das Kapital if you're studying economics. Um, the other lesser work that he's more famous for, I would say you should throw in the bin. But Das Kapital is a really fascinating book about, you know, about uh, understanding, you know, the capitalist system. Uh, his interpretations, let's just say, are wildly off. <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's not a good, not not a good, uh, not a good read. I mean, I, I, I mean, what do you think, Steve? I mean, we haven't talked about the housing market itself. And I think maybe it's a good segue to sort of discuss it. Um, do you think it's going to affect sort of inventory levels and prices, all this stuff around the edges, or is it, is this just, is this, is this just theater, all these programs? Uh, I think they're all like very well intentioned. I just think there's just, everyone's looking out for their best interests and, and trying to get reelected and, and it's a complicated mess. I just think ultimately like, yeah, we're, we're stroking checks and governments are are doing what they do. But I just, I think like, I think the core theme is really just like what Keith has been banging his drum on since episode one, which is all levels of government are desperate for, for tax revenues um, because the, the blob keeps getting larger and larger and it needs to feed itself and it's just, it's eating everything. And so the only way, I mean, seemingly for a lot of these municipalities, um, you know, chatting with, with people that are, pretty high up in the space is basically okay here's what's happening governments want to get reelected at, at let's say at the municipal level they are increasingly having to raise property taxes to basically fund itself it's not politically palpable to raise property taxes um, and so they're trying to mitigate raising property taxes and they're basically doing it through development fees. So what they're doing is saying, okay, well, let's just jack up development fees. And that way we'll get more of our revenues from that source, as opposed to taking it through property taxes. Because like, let's be honest, like the average person's not focused on how much development fees are going on. The developers mm -hmm. sure are, but everybody else is it's not following along. So I think it's easier to sell that politically. Uh, but again, the net, the net result is just less houses get built and, you know, we found out this week uh, that we we brought in 1.27 million people over the last 12 months, which is the highest number of people on record. <laughs> so, you know, we're going we're going full circle. And what about so. inventories? Are people putting stuff like I know this is a bit different, but what about inventories and listings? Are you seeing that increase or decrease? I mean, yeah, right now I think we're seeing I think the housing market's kind of like ebbing and flowing over the last, you know, 18 months, 24 months. It seems like we're just in the market that just kind of is kind of chopping 
um, chopping around. It's like you get a little bit of a rip for three months, then it kind of it dies off for three or four months and it kind of picks up. And right now I think we're in the die off period. Um, things have slowed down. You're seeing prices coming off again. So we'll see. So I mean, ever since we had the, you know, enjoy the moment moment when the bank of Canada cut by 25 basis points, you know, from, you know, from your network, did that give a, any kind of a boost to any housing market? I would say that activity has picked up. Like, we're seeing more people coming off the sidelines, like buyers are stepping up. I still think it's a very mixed market. Like it's, it's still a market that's much slower than it was in January, February of this year, March. Like, let's put it this way. If you're selling a house, like if you're selling a house in Vancouver, you're getting, I would say like you're taking 5% less today than you were in March. So I just think it's like, it was, yeah, it's just, a, I don't know. It's a really, it's a tough housing market. It's hard to price things. Um, it's hard to say what things are worth. Some houses are going into multiple offers still, and there's a lot of product that's just sitting and going no bid. So I don't know. It's so, just so who's waiting? Is it buyers or sellers? I I mean I'd say buyers. I think we're getting a decent amount of new listings now. Like finally, I mean last year was marked by twenty year lows and new listings. Sellers just didn't bring stuff to market. Now we're getting a normalization of new listings and, you know, in the condo market, actually a 20 year high in new listings. So like inventory is coming to market. And I think buyers are saying, Hey, you know what? Like, I think prices might come down further. And so maybe I'm not in a rush to, to pull the trigger. We'll see. I, I mean, it will be interesting, right? You get that one cut from the BOC. I've been watching bond yields closely. Like you're getting, you're getting fixed rate mortgages now back under 5%. So I'm kind of curious to see how that will play out in the uh, in the coming weeks and months. And we say housing, we often throw that around, but there's you know multifamily sort of condo listings, right? And then there's the single family homes and stuff. And what I'm looking at is like single family housing starts are basically at all time lows, or at least the series goes back to 2014. Yeah, um, single and, family but, and then, housing starts getting crashed across Canada. Yeah. And then there's urban areas, multifamily housing, and that's actually, you know, at 203,000. So that's actually quite strong. I mean, do you, do you see it in a world where because we don't build any single family units that that price level just stay that bid stays really, really strong for that? And then there's a lot of weakness in condos that are no longer viable for, you know, you're not going to pay $500,000 mm -hmm. for a condo that's 500 square feet. With massive condo, you know what I mean? Like, is there going to yeah, be sort of yeah, another yeah, yeah, bifurcation? Yeah, sure. So the housing starts dropping precipitously is is because like if you think about a housing start and the people that are building like a single family house, like you can be incredibly nimble, right? You can just be like you can you can stop construction like tomorrow. Whereas like a multifamily apartment, if you're building like a thirty story high rise building, yeah. like that's years and years of planning in the process. And like once you've committed to going you keep That's going it. like you, you don't, you don't just stop and say, well, hold on. Market's not good. I better like stop. Like once you're, once you're in the process, so like housing starts on the multifamily side are like definitely a lagging indicator. So like, if you look okay. at the numbers today, people are like, well, housing starts haven't really dropped off, but like on the ground, like new projects are not being drafted up and conceived. So it's going to get worse from here, you think? That the oh, single 100%. family housing starts. Okay. Housing like check in 12 months from now, housing starts are going to be like they're going to get absolutely decimated. But wait a second, there's an accelerator fund and and we've spent so much money in, uh rezoning but it is accelerating. possible. Rich, it's accelerating but in in the wrong direction. Oh, okay. Like. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My so fault. with, uh, you know, I'm like anyone else, and you're always looking for opportunities to do things. So if let's just say someone has the view that housing could come off kind of hardish for a number of different reasons, maybe it's Canadian domestic reason or an external factor or whatever. Steve, talk about how the in financing initial investment works for some of these multi-unit you know, condo buildings that go, go up, like from day one, how many does, does the developer have to sell? What is he financing? Mm -hmm. And at which point would the, uh, what do you call it? Is it the pre-sale market? Yeah. yeah. So, like okay. It? So 
yeah, typically speaking, like, you know, you're going to go out there, you're going to acquire the land. You know, a lot of times there's like a general partner, limited partner structure. So you're going to go out there and you're going to raise, you know, outside capital. So, you know, when you're doing that, you have to show, you know, your investors, your pro forma. And of course, you know, when rates go up 500 basis points, that certainly changes the math. Cost of construction changes the math, et cetera. Now, you know, now you can throw in the capital gains inclusion rates and like there's just a larger hurdle rate for uh, return. And so that's number one. Number two is like once you actually, you know, proceed with your uh, permits and you get the project approved, you submit, you know, your development application. Like now you're going to go and, and do pre-sales, right? So you're going to launch a presentation center. You're going to go out there. You're going to build it. You're going to hire a marketing staff. You're going to run all of these ads, right? In order for you to do that, you have to be really confident going into it that like you you feel like you're going to hit your, your pre-sale targets. Because typically speaking, you have to sell on average about 60% of the units have to be pre-sold in order to obtain construction financing from a lender. So you have to know going into it before you build a presentation center and hire all the marketing staff and spend millions of dollars on this endeavor, you need to be confident that you're going to hit 60% of your sales. And so pre-sales lead housing starts. And what we're seeing right now is pre-sales in the GTA. I think they're at 10 year lows that might even be lower than that, but for sure we're at decade low in pre-sales, uh, greater Vancouver. We're on the trajectory to see the lowest uh, pre-sales as well in the last 10 years. So like pre-sales lead housing starts, right? If you can't pre-sell the units required to put a shovel in the ground, then they don't get built. So that's why I'm saying to you, like housing starts are very much a lagging indicator and uh, we'll see the, the true numbers will be reflected in the data 12 to 18 months from now. So in this example, then let's just go right from from day one. So just say you you are the uh, you, you're the general uh, partner, you're the GP, and you just say you have let's just say say it's five million bucks or a million bucks that you have, mm -hmm. and you come to Rich and I and you say, hey, here's this opportunity that I'm putting together. I want you guys to add five hundred grand each, and you'll be a limited partner. So, mm -hmm. so the three of us have the partnership. You're the GP, Rich and I are the uh, the LPs, and with that, that's what we use then to go to acquire the the land. Is that right? And we might have that financed. Yeah, yeah. Like oftentimes, there's different ways to structure it, and depends on the developer and how deep your sort of capital pool is. But you know, there's definitely times where you know, upon acquiring the land, you know, you might have a condition in there, Hey, subject to this and that. And so during your due diligence period, you'd go out and raise the capital and say, listen, I've tied up this piece of dirt. I need the capital to obviously go through with it. So let me go and do my equity raising there. So like there's, there's different ways to do it basically. But, uh, and so again, I think you have to sell that story, right? You have to sell the story today to outside investors of why should you deploy capital in Canada, in the Canadian housing market, um, and earn like a, you know, a decent return that is relatively low risk. Right. And I think today, like, I think the risks are high, right. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty around government around the Texas. economic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the economic <laughs> prospects in this country, well, I think there's a lot of certainty with the tax side, here. <laughs> you know, yeah. which way it's going. Yeah. So, so let's just say yeah. then we, you know, we, we put our property together and we, you know, we, we, we sold 60% of, of the units and, you know, we're, we're digging the ground up, which got the chainsaw out and, and all that fun stuff. Um, and then all of a sudden, the guys that did the, the pre-buys, I guess in this, in this case, say one or two or a few of them, they need to sell. So there, there's two questions there. One is, how do they do it? And then the second question is, even if they're doing that, all of us being equal, it shouldn't affect us continuing with the build, should it? Unless well, there's I a mean, big override, overriding macro factor. I mean, you can typically way. try to assign the contract and get out, but I tell you those are very illiquid contracts and, and some developers will actually say you can't assign or flip those contracts. So like, to be honest, they're kind of illiquid instruments. And so, you know, if you're committing to, um, if you're committing 
to a pre-sale, like you're kind of, you're, your capital is more or less locked up. And this is why we like, you know, I always like, you know, it's interesting because like there's a lot of people that go out there and bash on pre-sale investors and say, oh, these guys are speculators. You need to get them out of the market. But it's like, well, hold on. Yeah, they're speculators. They're the ones that are financing the project. They're taking the capital risk and investing in the building. And like, to be honest, like, yeah, they've done really well over the last 10, 15 years. And I can guarantee you they're probably going to underperform over the next five to 10 years. So they're kind of a necessary evil because that's the way you fund construction in this country. And so. to be fair, I mean, just go, Rich did not read this in his Karl Marx book, but you need speculators, <laughs> <laughs> but we need speculators in, in, in the world. You know, that's what encourages investment and, if you take a risk and it is an outsized uh, risk that you're taking, if it pays off, then, you know, you should be very well rewarded for it. That's just the way capitalism works. Capital C, A, P, not the, the communist spelling, but uh, Commies. <laughs> Commies. Well, we're but, told, uh, we're told these days that investment is bad. Capital gains inclusion rate is going up and, um, you know, investment and risk taking shall shall be punished. That's dumb. Yeah. So, so just one more question on on this because uh, I find this interesting because I, I know a lot of people in in my network. You know, they're, they're you know they've accumulated uh, liquid capital is on the sideline, and if, if something interesting happened in our economy up here that caused real estate to go lower, I know a lot of people are going to jump in. Right, with, mm -hmm. with two feet and, and and buy up. Are you saying then for some of these attractive buildings and complexes that are they're being put together, it's going to be hard to acquire one of those pre-sale units? Instead, how do you take advantage of that world? Do you, do you understand? Oh yeah, well, I mean, you're saying like a so here. I mean, the idea is basically someone bought in as a pre-sale into the building. So let's say like you know, 18 months ago they bought in and then all of a sudden rates spiked and like, Oh my gosh, this thing's coming up for completion. I got to get out. I can't, I can't afford the mortgage. I'm going to try to offload this through an assignment and, and get out and basically flip the paper to somebody else. The problem is, is like, so yes, there's going to be some opportunities there. I think the problem is, is the opportunities probably aren't going to be as good as people think. And the reason being is because a lot of these pre-sales that were bought, they were bought at such like high prices. Like they were bought, you know, it's a futures contract, right? And these, the futures contract is 15% more than the spot price. Yeah. So it's like, even if I say to well, you, well, hey, I'll sell it to you at a 15% discount. It's like, well, it's still not a good deal. It's like, you're basically just now giving it to me for spot. So this is the issue in the pre-sale market is like, yeah, there's some motivated people, but like, to be honest, the deals and the discounts still aren't really attractive. But it becomes, it becomes a, a deal if you're providing liquidity to someone who has to sell. What do you mean? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, which is like, if there's a forced seller, like any bit, like a lot of the, it's, you know, a lot of opportunities are generally where mismatches in liquidity happen. So if you need cash and someone else has cash, where those two things square is where that person extracts well, that profit. Yeah, and here's right? what I'd say to you is like, there's only so much like someone can lose, right? Because like, when you're buying a presale, you're just putting down your deposit, right? So you're putting down, let's say a 15 or 20% deposit. So like, if you're gonna say, well, Steve, I'll give you a 30%, I'll, I'll buy your presale, but, but, but for a 30% discount, you're like, well, I'd rather just walk away from my 20% deposit than right. sell it for a 30% loss. Yeah, the developer can technically sue me for the difference and come after me. But like again, not every developer is going to do that because there's a lot of cost and pain and headache to try to go after people to sue them. How big is the developer? Does the developer actually have the wherewithal to do that? Like if it's a small and medium-sized developer, they're not going after all these buyers because right. they might not even be in business in a year from now. So I didn't yeah. realize it was the walk away factor, you know, yeah. and yeah. So if Jingle, you do walk keys away, in the mail, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. That's cool. Uh, I was really, into, I really am interested in but that. Those are genuine questions. <laughs> so Mr. Marks, did you have any questions for, for no, Steve? No, I did on, for on now. Thank works? you. <laughs> you know what the P and L stand for? It was profit and loss. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> carry on. Let's well, keep going. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I just while we're kind of on like the government program <laughs> stuff, um, I was going to bring up our good friend, you know, Rich, I know you've been harping home this point for a while is sort of <sighs> people using climate change as a way to extract dollars um that i think there's some some bad actors in the space steve, and... steve in the uh the political science manual that's uh comes in grifting it's in chapter <laughs> there's some grifting going on and uh it appears uh our buddy friend of the show steve gilbo uh the environment minister in canada he's a large shareholder in the venture capital investment firm cycle capital whose companies have gotten over 200 million dollars in grants from his own government, the liberal government. Uh, and since he's become environment minister, he's they've uh, received an additional $17 million um, from that green energy fund, Rich, which has been under a lot of scrutiny and, and, and a lot of scandal <laughs> over the last 12 months. There's a lot of people saying, well, where did the money go? It's, and, it's, it's just the shameless slush fund, right? It's just, and, and it's not even clear that I think, I think I've read that on CBC, just to be clear, uh, that a lot of this money has gone to things that don't even necessarily affect emissions in any way, not to mention that Canada's emissions remain flat to slightly up. Um, I mean, is it just a massive, massive grift here? What are we talking about? I mean, it's besides the rank corruption, is it just really money that's allocated to sort of, you know, push around and 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 sort of uh, curry favor with your constituents? And I think it's alleged. That's the correct term. To use <laughs> Sorry, here, right? Excuse me. It's alleged. I apologize. Just to be clear for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. For the censors. I mean, we've had Andrew Haynes on the show. Um, oh yeah. Energy, uh, big energy guy here in Canada, and he was he's been kind of highlighting some of the uh, the ties there between uh, Mr. Gilbo and um, you know some of these, um, you know involved in some clean tech investments with the uh, P PRC, People's Republic of China, involved with, uh, of course, Cycle Capital. Uh, and so, I don't know, there's just something, something fishy. fishy, something smells bad in all of this. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's really, it's a real shame. I wonder that's, I wonder why on some level that that's why there's been so much pushback against things like nuclear power, which are just very oh, unsexy. You know, like nuclear power is boring. If, if you know, it's it's been around forever. It's not newfangled technology. Um, I remember Dr. Kiefer told us that you know, basically there hasn't really been that much innovation in the space. Yes, they tweak around the edges. Um, and the can do reactor is you know state of the art, etc. But I wonder, you know, if it if it really if it really is about lowering emissions then that's the most obvious and effective way, except, you know, cycle capital is not in the nuclear power business and neither is uh, Brookfield Asset Management and, you know, and a couple other very interesting um, companies with links to these people. And so I just, I wonder why we aren't just funneling money into can do uh, and just to sort it out, but seems naive, like it's a can. It's, it seems like it's a can don't. <laughs> oh my God. Keith Swamp, buddy, we got to drain it. It's the blob. I think, the you know, blob. I would like to believe, and I, I do believe this, when when people are involved in all levels of government, their intentions are always pure and honest. That's what they start with. And then as the blob gets a hold of it, it, it does become distorted. Now, that doesn't mean that the intention of uh, an individual or a group, we, we can disagree with that intention, which I think we do with some of these policies that are out there. But by the time it does go through the ringer, uh, you know, the, the blob gets a hold of it and it probably comes out in a form that was been unintended. Or maybe yeah. you're all, are we, is that a smirk on Steve's face? No, I like, just, well, like yeah, I mean, I, it's. I'm it's, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt here. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, maybe he's well intentioned. I mean, he's certainly, uh, man, I feel, almost feel bad for that guy. He's, I think every tweet he's ever had, he just gets ratioed uh, oh man oblivion it's just horrible if you guys haven't followed him on twitter you have to look at his tweets it's just well i mean, yeah, I, mean I said he's the most i said he's i mean he might be the most hated man in canada <laughs> but um so just kind of again pulling on that green energy thread there rich 
Um, it's funny because I'm here in BC, and so you know we've got our BC LNG, and you know I think there's a lot of people that are that are proud of that. And there's um, so actually it's interesting because on a lot of the public buses they've had these uh, ads on on the public buses that say you know BC LNG, you know clean natural gas uh, is is you know good for uh, fighting the global climate change, you know. Etc. Which we've talked about. I mean, if you shipped off, you know, LNG across the world and got China and India off their coal power plants, it would certainly do a huge dent in in lowering overall emissions. And so, you know, but there's been a lot of people that have been upset about that advertisement. And we have uh, in Parliament right now, uh, we have there's Matt there's there basically is a new bill that has been put forth and actually was was passed a couple of weeks ago which basically makes it uh, it is prohibited for a person to promote a fossil fuel or the production of a fossil fuel in a manner that states or suggests that the fossil fuel its productions or its emissions are less harmful than other fossil fuels their production or their emissions and b in a manner that states or suggests that a fossil fuel or the practices of a producer of the fossil fuel industry would lead to a positive outcomes in relation to the environment, the health <laughs> of Canadians, the reconciliation with indigenous people. Oh my God. Or the kidding? Canadian or global economy. And uh, just to keep going on this. So yes, it was passed by the house of Commons on May 28th. And um, yeah. This is I mean, the Babylon B right or the onion so it's called about. and this yeah this is called bill if you guys if anyone's listening to the show feel free to look it up google it it's called b uh bill c59 bill c59 um which basically provides heavy legislation about promoting the, the use or the benefits of fossil fuels um which i think so is if you concerning. if you think differently than what the blob is telling you to think you're not allowed to share that with anyone in print or social media so the is bill just the, the, sorry just to interrupt you the bill does await royal assent but it has passed the uh, house of commons by what vote like how do they how, how was the well, vote along party out? lines along party lines really are we sure or did you know because there are blobs on both sides right yeah I mean, I let's just. I mean, I, I for me, it's about you know everybody. All this shit about ta like follow the science, follow the science. I mean, the science is that burning natural gas emits fifty percent less carbon emissions than coal. That is an undisputed. Not that uh, science is normally settled, but I would submit that it'll take a lot of evidence to um, convince people um, to the contrary. Um, and that's how the U.S. has lowered emiss its emissions by 30 percent. We've talked about this a lot on this podcast. If you as part of this, again, if your idea an ideal is to lower emissions, part of that process is moving away from coal. Coal, by the way, which is rising in India, China, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, and, you know, half a dozen others. Sorry, not Mexico, Vietnam and half a dozen other emerging markets. If you want to pick, take people off coal, you need to put them onto natural gas, which is relatively easy to do. And so the fact that they're sort of challenging that, I mean, very basic fact is extremely anti-science, I, I would submit. But doesn't this bill suggest that if you make that argument, that you're not allowed to, to, to share this view? I, I'm yeah. confused here. So yeah, exactly. you're saying, hey, net gas is actually better relative to coal or, yeah, of course. or oil when we can get a substitute for it. But you can't say that at all. Is, is that right, Steve? Yeah, basically. So it says, uh, just reading it a little bit further here, it says, you cannot ba basically you cannot make a representation to the public in the form of a statement, warranty, or guarantee of a product's benefits for protecting or restoring the environment or mitigating the environmental, social, and ecological causes or effects of climate change that is not based on an adequate and proper test, the proof of which lies in the person making the representation um, and you can't make a representation of the public with respect to the benefits of a business or business activity for protecting, restoring the environment or mitigating the environmental and ecological causes or effects of climate change that is not based on adequate and proper 
substantiation in accordance with internationally recognized methodology, the proof of which lies, again, on the person making the representation. And so basically the threat of which uh, is massive fines, and it can be up to 3% of a company's gross av- annual revenues. Um, this is environmental extremism. I mean, there's no other real way to say it. Um, and I, I, it drives me absolutely crazy. These people are not interested in emancipating working class people. They're not interested in growing our economy, which 30% of our exports are fossil fuels. We've talked about how it generates 4.5% of GDP in current account surplus, which is returned in hard currency, which basically pays for our welfare states as um, and these people hate growth. I mean, it's a, it's, it's this degrowth anti-humanistic thing. And I'm sorry to be so sharp. And my friends who listen to this podcast will probably, I'll get some bad text messages saying I've gone too far, but that's it. They, they are anti-human. I mean, how else can you describe it without fossil fuels, which we burn, you know, in size globally, the human condition would be far, far, far worse. The interesting wow. thing I, I find here is that, you know, there, you know, this bill is stating that, hey, this is the science, this is the fact, and you can't go against it. Uh, I, I just read here this morning that... But Keith, I mean, go ahead. Let's, I'll let you finish that. Finish that. Okay. Finish that. Yeah. Uh, there's an open letter praising the federal liberals carbon tax signed by 344 academic economists. And a lot of these economists have been linked to receiving non-competitive government contracts to do research <laughs> i just so it, it, think it, go ahead oh well i just think again how much of this like again like it just concerns me because you know, how much of like the science i think we saw during like covid and the pandemic was like you know all you heard is follow the science follow the science and then like you know year or two later we've learned that a lot of what we were told w- was not was not true and you know whether it was the 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 you know, the mutations of the, of the virus or the efficacy of these vaccines and, you know, or, or mask wearing and, you know, all like, it was all about fall of the science and it was never like, yeah, I just think that, you know, Rich, you commented earlier. I don't know if science is necessarily always black and white. Like it's something that you're continuously learning. And so I agree with you in some ways, but I also disagree with you in others. I mean, we are pretty sure how many molecules of hydrogen and oxygen, or sorry, atoms of hydrogen and oxygen are in water, right? H2O. We understand, you know, um, how to how to refine gasoline in order, or sorry, refine crude oil and to produce gasoline, kerosene, and other types of products. I mean, there are certain pieces of science that, forgive the expression, are genuinely settled, or let's just say if the person came up with a different way, they would be basically given Nobel Prize tomorrow. One of these things we very much understand is burning coal produces twice as much emission as natural gas. We understand this. Now, is it settled? Okay, that's, I'll leave, the, leave it to the physicist to decide this. But to not have a cogent and honest discussion about the trade-offs, because that's what we're talking about here for an economy and ultimately... Working class people always eat the bag of Cheetos when, you know, when these kind of bad policies come through to like force people not to have those discussions, which is exactly what this bill tries seeks to do. It paints all fossil fuels as bad. Well, we know that this is not true. And I think that that's that's illiberal. That is authoritarian. That's an authoritarian diktat. That is like something, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but that's something like out of the Soviet Union, you know, I mean, to like basically ban the discussion on a specific type of product because our dear leader feels that it's not good for our society. That That's that's not sensible policy. Yeah. So I the, think uh... somewhere in there, he used the word commie in there. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> Pathways Alliance, which is the... Um mix or the bag i should say of of canadian oil and gas companies it's like basically their the alliance the pathways alliance uh they put out a note uh here this week saying um that they are removing all of their because of due to the 
changes of Bill C-59 um, and the complexities that it's bringing forth and the unknowns, they basically are removing all of their communications, uh, including all their content on their website, social media, and other public communications. So um, there you have it, the Pathways Alliance, which is some of your largest publicly traded Canadian oil and gas companies, which employ you know thousands and thousands of people here, um, is saying they're now removing all of their content until they can kind of figure out how this is all going to settle out. I don't know. It's just, it's interesting, right? I mean, it's, I think the larger concern is here is the lack of conversation and, and being told what you can discuss and what you cannot discuss and what it's, it's a slippery slope. You know, it's, I mean, the last, uh, my last comment on it and, you know, I'll, I'll probably flub it up a little bit, but the, the industry, you've always been trying to reduce pollution. I mean, that's what we're trying to do with everything we do. Hey, you want cleaner rivers and better forests and more efficient energy. And, and I mean, that's always happening. But the way this conversation has now been twisted and that you're not allowed to question, but I'll question it here, right? Because we're the loony hour. We can do this. It, it's always, it's, it's based on that carbon emissions is changing our climate. And there's a lot of data out there that suggests, yeah, it absolutely is. There's other data when you change the X and Y axis, you realize, hey, actually it isn't. And maybe, just maybe, and this is the conversation you're not allowed to have, that the contribution to any of the climate change we're having that's coming from carbon emissions is very low. It is actually, this is just a natural phenomena that, that that's happening o- over years you know, with, with Earth. And it turns out maybe, you know, maybe years from now when we do better research on it or we have more better level-headed discussions with it, we figure out, my God, yeah, we were really, you know, turning the knobs on, as Rich would always point out, on lower income uh, households, because they're the ones that do pay for this at the end of the day. And it was wrong. You know, it was just plain wrong. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you don't want to go down like the the whole climate change rabbit hole and you know, be labeled as a conspiracy theorist and have the show canceled and banned. I think more so like, you know, if we, you know, focus the conversation and, you know, the deliberations here around the overwhelming concern around silencing debate and, and, and removing the ability for really any discussion, I think is, is kind of the slippery slope. And I think, again, it's not just related to oil and gas. I think, again, I think the most clear evidence of this was during the pandemic was where if you had an opposing view and suggested that maybe, for example, COVID may have started in a lab somewhere <laughs> in Wuhan, that that was a massive conspiracy theory. And, and you know, no, but not just these- conspiracy theory. I'm jumping in there. People said that you were racist, right? We've I mean, we've challenged the ethic and the sensibilities around importing a million people within two one or two years and how that affects rents and how that affects the livelihoods of canadians Rich, whether that it's was, even fair but suggests- no, whether yeah i'm just saying people called us racist for that remember i mean that's yeah it was considered xenophobic and that you know you were anti-immigration it's like no no no, no one's saying we're anti-immigration it's saying is 1.2 million people is that the right number is it or should it be 400,000 or 500,000 or 600,000 people right you know and so yeah, I mean that's that's a great, again a great segue where we've got a million, one point two million people, um, rich, which allowed us to update our favorite chart, oh, yeah. <laughs> which was a GDP on a per capita basis. Um, so that's now been fall. It's gone nowhere since twenty seventeen. So yeah. seven seven years, no growth in real terms. In so real adjusted terms. for inflation. Sorry. Um, yeah, so adjusted for the population growth and inflation, there's been no growth in seven years. Um, we're, you know, we're anti-investment, you know, so we're raising taxes on investment. That's going to fix the problem apparently. Um, and, and also we don't like oil and gas. We hate it. It's bad. (laughs) And so just, yeah, I don't know. I guess from an economics perspective, you're kind of left scratching your head and saying, how we, how are we? How are we going to change the math here and, and go get out of this seven-year funk? So apparently what we do, I read an article this morning on, on the Bloomberg. Uh, so the way for Canada to increase productivity is to use more AI. And that's it. Oh, 
Chat GPT, it's, baby. I'm all over that. It's the solution to everything now. That's it's, that's what we need. It's okay. It doesesn't it smack a little bit of like 1998, 1999, where like they like you, you had a company, let's say like I don't know, that you like sold uh, pet food and then you like added dot com to the end of that company's name and the stock like went through the roof. Yeah. It is Looney Hour AI. Yes. You know, we should... <laughs> it is a bit odd right because you know we, everyone now like is living in the moment with this and that but i do remember back then and so this was like the late 90s basically when a company merely announced that they're launching a website the stock just went straight up because all of a sudden you're thinking wow i can buy online like that that's going to be in- incredible and you know as, as you pointed out richard you get some euphoria you know with with that uh, but yeah, but Canada right now, maybe uh, maybe that's the way we get out of or improve our productivity. I don't know. You know how much? Well, I don't Rich, know well enough. How much? We talked about this a little bit briefly on the podcast. I don't know, maybe a month ago. But the the data that's coming out right now showing the amount of energy usage from these oh, AI yeah. data centers is just like unbelievable. So everybody that keeps saying, you know peak oil demand and you know we're not going to need more of it moving forward i mean the amount of energy that these ai that's a good point steve so how do we do that how do we reconcile that in canada we need more ai you're stating (laughs) we we need ai to improve our productivity and yet we're going to run these uh the power generation unit with with what how are we going to run it and everyone's going to have heat pumps and you just plug it in. Well, no, with plug electric it into vehicles. The grid, well, let's just talk about this energy. So we've actually talked about this before. I can't, I can't find the article now, so forgive me. But basically, one of these uh, GPUs, these NVIDIA GPUs, I mean, there's many different types of GPUs out there, but I think if I remember correctly, basically draws 700 watts. Uh, sorry, kilowatts, I think. Um, I'm screwing this up, but I promise you that this is right. Um, and, and basically the amount that are sold in like one year is the amount of energy as a small city. I think that the city, the example that was used was Phoenix, Arizona. So every year we're adding a new Phoenix just in usage around the NVIDIA uh, chips and these data centers. There's something called Data Center Alley, which is just uh, near Virginia, Sorry, just near so near Washington in, in so Washington, D.C., in the state of Virginia. And there's a company called Dominion Energy. I don't want to get in trouble for naming tickers and stuff. But if you see, if you like look at their um, sort of annual reports, et cetera, all of their models have been blown up. So this is a sleepy utility that was burning natural gas and other stuff to produce energy for the local for local consumption. But then... I mean, Keith will tell you why they put all the data centers near Washington, D.C. I could never fathom any reasons. Um, and But basically, their energy consumption is basically blown out. And for the first time, I believe, since 1990, U.S. energy consumption is starting to rise. And it's a function, really, of bringing back a lot of these data centers and AI, et cetera, et cetera, to the U.S. And it's it's, it's really a fascinating story. Um, and it's, it's, it's why a lot of these utility companies have actually done very, very well, even though they're usually linked to yields so when yields fall these da- these utilities should, should actually fall as well um if i got that right hopefully but anyway so these utilities that used to be quite sleepy companies have actually done really well and it's because of this energy demand that steve is speaking of yes yeah, the rapid growth in data center workloads has led to a substantial increase in overall energy consumption growing by 20 to 40 percent annually in recent years for large data center operators um data center uses energy is projected to double by 2026 so anyways long story short that's that's wait wait of... what's what's going to double by 26 in two years uh data center data center energy usage yeah and so... i got it right so so nvidia's h100 gpu will consume more power than some countries each GPU consumes 700 watts of power. 3.5 million are expected to be sold in 2024. So that's the basically, that's the power of all households in Phoenix, Arizona by the end of 2024. That's just in NVIDIA chips, which is 
freaking wild. Now, obviously, the technology as it gets better and better will will change because it's very, but but it's still a freaking crazy stat. We're gonna have to fire up the coal plants again. Burn well, them on. I mean, coal yep. consumption is rising. That's a conversation for a different day. Stop googling. And how are they? <laughs> so, and how are they going to meet this uh, energy production in in the U.S. mostly? I mean, natural gas capacity. Do they have? I don't understand. I don't know that market well enough. Do they so have capacity available? Yeah. So they do. I mean, they do have. I mean, the capacity in the U.S. for energy because I mean, it's it's two things. One, price price solves this. So as these prices, like so as the demand increases, prices rise, and they have these. They have more money, whatever, to build that capacity. Solar is a real factor in the US for all of our hand wringing and grumbling about climate change and environmental policy. Solar in America is absolutely booming. And that will be really, really interesting going forward. And wind, for example, if you look at Texas, Texas is the wind and solar leader of America, uh, despite also being the oil biggest oil producer in the US, which is, you know, I'll let you think about that for a second. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're just, it, it's, they are, it is coming on. They're, they're, they're just, they're building more yeah, I infrastructure. Don't, I don't mean the production. Yeah, I actually oh, mean sorry. the grid. It's my understanding the grids are quite old. They need yeah. repair and improvement. So I can see, I mean, I mean, the U.S. has an amazing amount of potential or actually proven uh, ways to create more energy. But it's my understanding that the grids are not strong enough or efficient enough to, to absorb it. All right. I mean, God, like they're having like in L is it LA recently, I think they had to, you know, whenever you have a you know, some of these grids that they had to put people on and rationing for so many hours a day, like at, at peak times in the summer and in, in those kinds of <laughs> events. Am I yeah. wrong? Or what, what No, I'm I, laughing uh, because I'm laughing because I'm gonna say something and you're not gonna like it, but it's true. So sleepy Joe Biden should be credited for you know, we can hate them all we want, but there's a couple of things that they've done really, really well. And part of this massive, massive deficit spending, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, all this stuff has been to funnel an incredible amount of construction, sorry, money into Nancy Pelosi's wallet, but also into um, huge, huge infrastructure spending around the grid. And so how do I know that? Well, on the Bloomberg machine, you can see where the construction dollars are spent by sector, housing, so non-residential, residential, and then within residential, you've got roads, power, uh, bridges, blah, 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 and all the power, all those, sorry, pardon the pun, all those lines that are, are for power and electricity infrastructure, whatever they're ripping, even in real terms, even if you adjust it for inflation, there's been loads and loads of money being pushed into this. So, you know, he got, they got that, this right. That so was called the, go ahead, Keith. Yeah. So that's great news then for the American e economy. And so that should <laughs> attract foreign capital. Exactly. Coming in, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. It's not happening in Canada. <laughs> yeah. What about, I, mean, <laughs> I, I imagine the UK and, and Europe, it, it isn't happening. And not as much. No. Yeah. Okay, so this is a very positive longer term development. Yeah. Because again, like the biggest, uh, what, what a significant threat to the American system what was their uh, their grids and that yeah. they're not able to, you know, hold everything that, that they need to. Sorry, Steve, I interrupted you. Go ahead, please. No, no, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, great conversation. You know, we've chatted about the, um, again, all the oil and the energy demands, et cetera. Um, you know, the economic prospects here in Canada. One of the charts that's been circulating on Twitter that I wanted to touch on briefly was the uh, the record short, the record short in uh, in the CAD, the Canadian dollar, um, which, you know, there must be a lot of people listening to the Looney Hour because we've been quite pessimistic or bearish on the Canadian dollar for a little while here now and and just sort of seeing that showing up um, in the in the data as well, Rich. Yeah, so I think you what you're referring to is non uh, net speculative contracts or something. Oh, I screwed that up. Uh, net speculative positioning, which is basically from the Chicago Board of Exchange. I can't believe I got that one right. And basically, they um, sort of aggregate the commercial and non commercial contracts around all kinds of things. So not just currencies, they do commodities. So for example, if you're coca-cola and you want to hedge your sugar exposure and these companies need to do that they, they have like sometimes they have tr whole trading teams that just trade commodities 
for a specific company that produce a specific product. That makes sense, I guess, if you want to mitigate some operational risk. But anyways, so the CBOE and other uh, aggregators of this data will collect and aggregate how many people are short or long a particular commodity or currency um, and and either for commercial or non-commercial purposes. And the chart that I think you're referring to is a massive net short position in the Canadian dollar versus the US dollar. So you always have to have the other side of that equation. Whenever you're long something, you're short something when it comes to currencies. And so people are short the, the Canadian dollar. Um, so that's sort of the context in the background. I, normally, these are contrarian indicators. Keith, I don't know if you if you want to add something to that. Uh, I'm actually trying to reproduce the <laughs> data. Here. Okay, well, anyways. Uh, He's on Looney Hour AI. Keith's on the Looney Hour AI. Yeah, I keep plugging that. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, everything Rich, Rich said, I mean, I mean, normally from a contrarian perspective, if you get an extreme position in any market, it can be currency world, commodity world, you know, the interest rate world, you, you name it. Uh, you know, it, it does suggest that uh, you, you should get a, a, a swing around. So this suggests all else being equal, uh, on, if there is no economic moment or geopolitical moment or, or something like that, then, you know, the Canadian dollar has the potential to, to bounce here, to strengthen. Um, and then from the other side of it, you say, hey, a lot of people in the world right now, for whatever reason, uh, they have gone short the Canadian yeah. dollar. So let I mean, so depending on which, yeah, I do. I have. I, I did recreate the chart here, um, because you know, every now and then you can get data on Twitter that's not quite accurate. So you have to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you trust, have to the trust the science. Trust the science, baby. But uh, yeah, on, on the face of it, you know, if, if someone is short, I mean, for us, like we, you know, we make more money when US dollar strengthens, not just versus CAD, but versus all currencies. And uh, so if you see this, you say, oh, wow, this aligns perfectly with our view. Um, and then you realize, uh oh, you know, you, you can get a little bit of a, uh, a recovery here. But from just a pure global perspective, you think about it, Canada hasn't really had a, a crisis before. So for to get this large and extreme short in the Canadian dollar, by default, it means either a lot of domestic guys are now shorting the CAD and they're getting out, or foreign investors are coming in to, to short, you know, to short the Canadian dollar contract. Uh, so this, you know, it, again, this is suggesting something is aligning up with a lot of things that we, we've talked about. It's a brilliant chart. Like it's one of these. Yeah. Holy smokes! It's so what's going on here? Like it should catch your attention. There's also another. Like an... oh. It caught Steve's attention though. That's 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 that's. No, I mean, is that just sometimes. like a in, in simple terms, just like an indictment on on how investors feel about the direction of the Canadian economy? If well, you're at least in Ottawa right now. But if you're in Ottawa right now and you're always pulling out, you know, now you can pull out another G7 victory. Say, hey, we have the most shorted currency in the G7. <laughs> are we getting paid for this? I don't think we are. I'm not seeing anything. That's not fair. We're not getting but like, any of but these. Steve, I'm going to give you credit, though, because I think this is also sort of something you were really quick to highlight. Um, you beat me to it anyways, which is the the fact that the, the Bank of Canada is going to sacrifice the Canadian dollar. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Right. We know because debts are too high. The housing market is such an important part of, as Justin Trudeau has mentioned, uh, people's savings and retirement plans. Um, debt servicing ratios are way too high and they want to lower them, blah, blah, blah. We, we've, we've talked about that a lot. But my point is, in, and so where's how do you square the circle? There must be an internal devaluation, uh, meaning that people need to spend less money. Governments need to spend less money. Well, we know the first one's sort of happening because of debt servicing ratios. The second one, governments are clearly not interested in spending less money. So basically that piece is is sort of muddled to not going to happen. And then we need, or and then the other way that you can square it is having an external devaluation, which is what you would articulate, I think, six months ago, Steve, which is the Bank of Canada is going to basically um, sacrifice the dollar. And I think a lot of these hedgers and speculators or whatever, I think, you could argue that they're sort of getting ahead of that or not ahead of that, but they're, they're, they're agreeing with you. They're all kind of, yeah. I mean, I think that, um, Keith, you know, we, we 
had that question from quite a few listener emails over a number of months now, which is, you know, asking about a housing crisis in Canada, when the housing bubble can or will burst and how it will burst. And, and, you know, Keith, I think you and I, the comment we've always kind of made and responded to people is that the, a crisis in the Canadian housing market won't be, won't happen domestically. Like it won't happen out of the will of government to lower house prices or enact policy that is going to harm housing prices. It would happen outside of Canada, Canada internationally through some sort of financial event that is out of the control of policymakers. And so I think what we're seeing is policymakers pulling the levers to try to keep housing afloat, whether this is, you know, OSFI, you know, turning a blind eye to mortgage deferrals and and not only mortgage deferrals, but extending amortizations to, you know, 50, 60, 70 years in some cases. Uh, it's through the Bank of Canada, more recently lowering interest rates. Um, but we always felt, Keith, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, that if there's a crisis in Canada, it would not be, it would not happen domestically. Yeah, it, well, it, it could get triggered domestically, but the, the point that, that you've made and we've been talking about it for a while, it, it, that, and, and this is what most Canadians don't realize, is that the trigger for a Canadian crisis, Canadian dollar crisis, housing market crisis, banking crisis, you, you name it, the, the trigger point could come from outside of Canada. Say so maybe it's it's China, Europe, you know, who knows what. And, and that's, you know, hey, you want to be, you know, a, a true global thinking person. That's what you have to, to think about. And that's a great point, Steve. And, you know, this is what's happening right now. I know we talk about Japan quite a bit or, you know, we bring it up. Not as much as we talk about Saskatchewan, but we do bring up <laughs> Japan. <laughs> we got it in. I don't we're not consistent with Saskatchewan. I think we should try to do it every every episode. <laughs> we, we too. We're doing okay, I think. Uh, but yeah, like yen is getting weaker. I just want to mention as well, uh, you know, um, some guys know they came out with a really good, housing piece yesterday it's from macro alchemist that's uh, that's your buddy isn't yeah. it i thought it was brent johnson that put that piece out yeah brent brent put this together with, with a couple of people macro and, alchemist uh, or alchemist alchemist <laughs> what it's called who gets the house and a quick 30 second version of this it's looking at global real estate markets but using china as the focal point or the view that's what you're looking out from and it's making the view because china has one of the most expenses or value created housing markets in the world i might get this number wrong but the housing market is valued at 50 trillion in china in china, in china. yeah i, I don't Maybe know the I exact gotta, number but it's it, it's, it's a pretty big number but because so much wealth has, was created you know fictionally created maybe uh, that's what's been used by a lot of the Chinese to export to Vancouver, Toronto, San Francisco, you know, places like that. And now because that economy, the domestic economy of China is starting to weaken quite a bit, uh, the banks are struggling with credit, you know, capital outflows and certain stuff like that. It, it, the paper is suggesting this could be, you know, one of these external factors that you were just referencing, Steve. You know, that could trigger something here in Canada as well as Australia and so forth. Australia looks very vulnerable, you know, because they're so close to China with, with capital coming in. But I do uh, encourage people to, to find it on the Twitter, give it a read. And uh, it, it's good. It's a real good piece. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I haven't read it yet. You sent it to me and I've been I've been meaning to read it. I think it's what is it like 45, 50 pages or something. So like it's 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 a pretty long one. But I think maybe there's there's a lot of pictures. Steve. Yeah, so you got yeah. you stole. Yeah, I was going to say that there's a lot of pictures. <laughs> thank God. Um, but I mean, this is just a food for thought. I'll, I'll give it a read this weekend and, and maybe we can have Brent Johnson on the show to sort of discuss, unpack, uh, deliberate on that piece. Keith, I know he's your buddy, so maybe we can bring him onto the show once more. But I'd be, I'd be really curious. I mean, I honestly like food for thought. Is like I, that's something I've always kind of thought about. To be honest, I mean, we're the foreign investment flows into places like Vancouver, for example, have been a trickle of what they used to be since basically 2016, and 
you know, I also wonder too, like, yeah, like if that country is truly going through a crisis, like if you're wealthy and you, of course you're connected to the CPP or CCP, do you just, do you just run for the exits knowing that your economy is about to get crunched? Do you just try to get capital out as quickly as possible? I'm always curious. Like I, yeah, I mean, I'd have to read his piece and, and, and I think you should share with everyone what the second C stands for in the CCP. <laughs> Chinese commie party. But wait, there's 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 more just like to, to, to round this out. I mean, we're seeing I mean, we, we often talk about sort of how uh, equity indices provide information. Um, and then in, I think in February, on February 29th, we talked about how the property index in China bottomed uh, and actually went on a freaking tear. And the joke was that, it, you know, <laughs> after falling 90 percent, it went up 30 percent. Uh, it's actually started to roll over again. And we're seeing a lot of weakness. Money supply in China, which is not exactly, but related to credit growth is now negative. If you look at M1 money supply is contracting. M2 money supply is the lowest it's been in a decade plus. Um, there's something called, you know, total social lending, which is sort of an aggregate. That's off, you know, that that's quite low. And and house prices in, in general have, have continued to decline despite the fact that they've, made some efforts uh, to arrest that decline. Now you could argue it's because it hasn't flown through, et cetera, et cetera. But the sort of more sensitive market-based um, indicators on whether or not that policy for housing is working or not working are sort of saying it's not working. Yeah, so we, uh, China's Chinese central bank chief was has warned, he's come out publicly, warning of weaker credit growth as yeah. property lending declines. So... Yeah, I mean, who knows? People have been talking about a, a credit crunch or crisis in China for for decades now, but um, maybe we're and it has, going. But it and has maybe... been happening over the last decade. It, you know, you yeah. no longer, you know, you, you might remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you know, typical annual GDP growth was, you know, 10%, 12%, 14%. Like Whatever now. they said it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Goal seek, you know, function on your spreadsheet. But uh, now, you know, growth in China, it's make the real number, it's probably 2 3%, right? Yeah, Down the size, of the size of the Americans. So there was no Chinese miracle. There's no Asian miracle. There's no No, American it's not true. Miracle. Come on. It's Come all... on. That's not true. No, it's, it is true, Rich. It, I don't agree dead. with that. It, it's debt driven growth. I mean, that that's what you get. And then you, I mean, China, they obviously benefited from uh, globalization, you know, getting uh, accepted into the uh, WTO. I think that's what it is, yep. right? And things like that. But, uh, you know, you, if you want to get outsized growth in anything, you pile on debt. It's like, in, like your equity market return, you know, if equities are up 10% and you've levered up 10 times. What's your return? Rich, a hundred. There you go. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> what happens if it's minus ten percent? What's your return? Uh, pass. It's it's zero, right? You okay. get wiped out. Yeah, your equity is wiped out. So uh, that's that's where she is. Oh, but, you know, maybe before we forget, guys, remind everyone: next Wednesday is uh, CPI day here in Canada. So uh, you know, yeah, we'll have that. a big, uh, potentially, you know, big data point. Something to talk about on the loony hour next week, maybe. Heading into oh, the long I'm, weekend. Canada Day is coming up. It's Saint, oh, well, I have two announcements. I just want to wish everybody a happy Saint Jean Baptiste, which is uh, the, the national holiday here in Quebec. And um, I also want to say that because I'm jealous and feeling left out about your stupid Calgary adventure, I'm going to have a similar much better and more fun in Montreal social thing sometime in July. So uh, stay tuned. We'll get the details going. We'll get Steve to plan it. <laughs> ooh, ooh, nobody go. Uh, Rich, and, uh, I'll come. I'll be there. Okay. okay. <laughs> but yeah, so I we're going to sort I that out. I love getting out there. I love that stuff. That, that's fun. <laughs> and by the way, Rich, the Calgary event was was fantastic. The people were amazing. We made some made a lot of new friends. And it was a lot of fun. So we definitely definitely be back that way again. I don't believe you. I heard terrible feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Steak was good. No, we got we actually got a bunch of emails from people saying very, very appreciative. So that made me feel even worse about missing it. So yeah, like I said, we're gonna do something in July, uh, July to to make up for it. 
quite a bit in the planning stages, but it's a good place to leave it. Uh, as always, guys, we appreciate the support. If you've you know found this show entertaining, useful, valuable, all we ask is that uh, you share this episode with at least one friend or family member. And uh, if God willing, you're willing to leave us a review. I think we've got like over 1,100 or something now on Spotify. But leave us leave the Looney Hour five star. Leave the Looney Hour AI a uh, five star <laughs> review, and uh, we'll see you next week.